Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so to, for today, our stats club, I was going to be going over um, some, uh, I guess, like how to run deconvolution, um, kind of like from a Libra perspective, like with some of the data um, that we, some of the data forms that we, you know, uh, are familiar with. And then also with some of the tools that I've developed um, for Combo Buddies, which is a package that I have under development for um, tools to help like prepare your data for deconvolution and then also plot uh, some uh, like different helpful plots both during the marker selection process and um, once you have your actual deconvolution results. So um, very briefly, I'll go over like basic concepts. Um, I guess like show of hands from the crowd, how many people are like familiar with deconvolution and like understand what it achieves. Um, Okay, got a thumbs up from Leo. Um, okay, got a thumbs up from KJ. Um, okay, so for everybody else, kind of the idea is that like, uh, imagine that, you know, this is like a little like Lego brain diagram that you might've seen before. So imagine in tissue, there's a lot of different cell types that have like uh, unique and specific functions and therefore they have unique and specific um, like RNA, uh, transcriptomic profiles, right? They they express different genes and different proteins. Um, so from this tissue, which is very complex, we can kind of like get different sorts of data. The uh, source of data we you know we're familiar with and use a lot for case control experiments at Lieber is bulk RNA seq. So basically, that takes all of that complexity of the tissue and it just kind of like breaks it all up, you know, blends it all together, and we get like. A variety of different cells, but it looks like one data point. So we kind of have like a pile of Legos where the Legos are like a different different cell types. And then other data that's like becoming more and more popular is the single cell or single nucleus RNA seq, which basically measures the um, RNA expression of each individual nuclei or cell. And that way you can group them together in similar populations and be like, this is what the neurons in this sample expressed, for instance. So yeah, my example here is that like when we do bulk RNA seq, it kind of obscures that complexity in the tissue, but it's cheaper. We can do way more of it, and it's like I guess like less, um, I guess computationally intense to work with the bulk RNA seq tissue. Where a single cell is much more expensive, and it also is like more complicated to work with. Um, so deconvolution kind of helps us estimate the breakdown of what cell types exist in this bulk RNA-seq sample without having to do single cell RNA-seq sample. So it's kind of like a, a freebie, a way to connect um, our bulk RNA-seq data to its cell type proportions. Um, so we use this by, uh, so we accomplish this by using single cell RNA-seq like a reference. So basically we know what the transcriptional profiles of the different cell types we're interested in and then use them to regress out what we think it looks like in the bulk RNA-seq data. Um, so do we have any questions off of that basic concept? All right, cool. Um, yeah, so we will move on. So yeah, like I said, I've been developing um, this package Decombo Buddies. It's very much under construction. So as you use it, you get any bugs, please report back to me. But um, we're gonna jump into the little demo I have for today. Um, so um, as I was kind of like creating this, I realized it might have been too much to type up in an hour. So, um, you know, feel free to follow along, but uh, it might be quite a bit to type. Um, so the packages we're gonna need today are um, the Decombo Buddies package. So these are gonna be functions that are important for um, marker finding doing some and doing some plotting and other explorations of the data. Um, and then you'll also need the BISC RNA um, so the Decombo Buddies is still like under development. So it's like off of the, so you'll need to install it with BioC Manager, but with the Libre Institute slash, because it's still just on GitHub, it is not actually on Bioconductor yet, um, but you know, that's the goal. Um, and then we're also gonna need the BISC RNA-seq package, um, which is going to be the software tool that actually helps us perform the deconvolution. Um, and then summarize, Experiment and single cell experiment we'll need because we're going to be working with a summarized and single cell experiment object. And we're also going to be using some of the Diplier. I might, might as well have this be tidyverse. I use that a little bit to manipulate a couple um, 
packages coming up. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is load up our data sets. Um, so I, I had this code on the Google Doc that I shared. Um, but basically, we're going to use Biosy file cache to download the um, Tran et al. Uh, DLPFC single cell experiment um, object. Um, so this is single cell experiment um, object that contains um, you know, data from DLPFC, which is the brain region we're going to focus on today. Um, that should load up. It might take a little bit longer for you if this is the first time you've loaded this data. Um, and then the second data we're going to load up is the bulk, is some bulk RNA-seq data. And we're going to, um, so this is, we're going to load on the brain seq phase two um, bulk expression. And this is going to um, be loaded into an object called RIC gene. And it's going to have information from the DLPFC and the hippocampus. So if we explore the call data for RIC gene quickly, um, yeah, you can see that. Um, yeah, so it's uh, we have 900 samples. So this is our, our rows and our call data. And we have 54 columns about different um, like information about these bulk RNA-seq samples. Um, ones we might be interested in are, so there's a lot of QC ones in here, but there are also um, information about like the phenotype data. So one that we're interested in would be the brain region. So we're going to filter this to just um, the DLPFC samples. And then diagnosis is also some or like sex and diagnosis or maybe like categorical variables that we're interested in looking at the differences in cell type compositions over specifically diagnosis, because that might be like a research question you're interested in, like, do the cell type compositions change? It also might be something that you're interested in controlling for um, when you like run differential expression. Um, so this is what the column data of this data looks like. Um, we also can see that it's a range summarized experiment. Um, again, we have 900 samples and it has expression for 58,000 genes and it contains the counts in RPKM assays. Um, yeah, so now we're gonna do a little bit of uh, fiddling with the data to make it more uh, friendly for deconvolution. So one thing we're gonna do is subset our bulk data to just those DLPFC samples. Um, we are working, uh, so this is like both to make it just like a little smaller and more friendly for doing working with it on your laptop. Um, and also um, because we have that matched single cell experiment, um, we are working to see if it's like critical to have matched single cell and um, bulk experiments. Right now, kind of our philosophy is that like you want more, the biggest reference that you can use. So we've used like multi-region experiments like in that, but um, for just today, we're gonna to use the match DLPFC just to keep it, the data manageable. Um, so again, so we're gonna subset to just these um, DLPFC samples, bringing our uh, number of samples down to 453. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at the SCE data. So this is the single cell. So this is gonna act as our reference set. So while that um, the RSE object, we're kind of gonna pretend is like the object that we're using as like, you know, we're going to do an experiment on coming up. Um, you know, we're going to run some analysis. Um, the, and then the SC is kind of more like a reference, something we got off the shelf. Um, so this is, again, from Matt Tran's work. Um, and this is in the DLPFC. And so you can see that this object is quite a bit larger. We have 11,202 cell or cells or nuclei out of that experiment compared to our um, 500 or so um, bulk, and this is only from a couple of donors. So the single cell experiment objects are just like bigger than the bulk ones. So they usually use way more memory when you're working with them. Um, so yeah, so we have 11,000 nuclei across and we have expression across 33,000 genes. And we have a count and log counts object. Um, so looking at the call data here, um, we have some other metrics. So we have barcodes so that's like what was like the unique tag for each like nuclei which is how we link like rna back to one individual nuclei we also have um some uh, qc metrics again like uh detected doublet scores those are like qcs that we use for single cell and then again we have like region labeled we have the donor um and then 
sex. So those are things that are like phenotype data. Um, and then one that really important piece of information will be the cell type. So that's like, um, you know, that's like the key column here for us, which, cause that's like what we're trying to find and like regress out is like um, how, like the, I guess like the proportions of the cell types that make up our final sample. So this is like a column that we're very interested in. So if we take a look at our cell type, uh, we can see that there's quite a number of different columns. This um, data is stored and like has annotated at like a pretty fine level. We can see we have astrocytes um, and then a number of different um, neurons. So there's excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. And we can see that these are annotated at like a pretty fine level. Um, so excitatory A, B, and C. So like that might be too fine for us. Like I think, right? So what resolution of cell types kind of depends on like your research question. Um, if you want to explore really fine cell types, you can, but it is going to take more work. It is harder to find marker genes and it is going to be like more computationally intensive. Um, we found kind of like the broad cell types is like a good place for us to work. Um, so that would be removing all these excitatory cell types and just working within like astrocytes, excitatory inhibitory. So I'm gonna do that here by just removing the little like suffixes from those cell types. Um, and you can, and then we're gonna tabulate that up. Um, so yeah, so this breaks it down. I don't know why this formatting got funky. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay, so now we kind of have like a class of excitatory and a class of inhibitory. And we can also see that there's some like rare cell types here. So there's very small population, only 10 macrophages, only 18 mirror cells and only nine T cells. So again, that's not gonna be like a lot of information. So I think for this demo and like just for this data set, we're gonna go ahead and drop those just cause we probably don't have enough information to actually like get good signal from those. Um, so I would recommend like dropping anything that's really teeny tiny, like under 50 cells is probably a good um, point. But again, if we had expanded and used like, so if there's like a pan version of this data, which includes multiple brain regions, um, then we have more larger populations so we can use them. But um, you wanna kind of exclude any really teeny tiny cell type populations. Um, so yeah, basically creating a list of my cell types. So these are gonna be the cell types I'm interested, astrocytes, excitatory, microglia, oligodendrocytes, and OPCs. And then I'm gonna subset the whole SCE object to just the cell, my cell types broad that are in this list of what I've deemed the good enough cell types. Okay, so here's the breakdown. Again, I don't know why my table is, is uh, being goofy here, but you can see that we have hundreds of, you know, 700 astrocytes, a couple thousand excitatory and inhibitory cells, and then a few hundred of the, the glia breaking down. Um, so that's gonna be kind of like our input data. Um, so does anybody have any questions about that data setup or why we might've done those steps? All right, cool. Okay, so we're gonna move on to talking about marker genes, if I can spell marker genes correctly in my document. Um, so uh, we're, we're gonna go back to my slides because I'm gonna explain some, some concepts about this. Um, and I think the recycling truck's about to come down my alley, so that's perfect timing. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so the idea behind like finding like really specific marker genes is that we want our, um, we wanna make like this regression like as clean as possible. So we know that there's some like genes that are like really specific for certain cell types. Um, so there's like some classic marker genes that you might've heard of, like MVP is a, like a classic marker gene for oligodendrocytes. Um, so kind of like we set out to find like, okay, how data-driven could we find like the cleanest marker genes possible? And we came up with this method that is called mean ratio. Um, so basically what we do is if we look over our cell type populations and, and like the expression of the gene, for instance, like MVP was the example I just shared, um, we want to select like the genes that have like the cleanest expression for just our target cell type, being like the cell type that the marker gene is, is supposed to mark for. Um, and then we want to see almost no expression in the other cell types. 
So we kind of devised this method called mean ratio. So what we do is we find the mean of the expression of the target cell type, and then we divide it by the mean expression of the second heart, second highest, or our non-target cell type. So target being this oligodendrocytes, second highest, and then it being a non-target um, would be the OPC. And then when you divide that, you get a mean ratio. So the, the bigger that mean ratio is, the farther apart these two lines would be, like, um, so like kind of like the cleaner expression. So this kind of makes sure that all of the other cell types are also pretty lowly expressed because by definition, they need to be lower than that highest non-target cell type. So this helped us find like much cleaner um, uh, marker genes. For instance, like, um, MVP being a classic one, and then our top marker gene in this example ended up being ST18. And we can see that this is like much different. We see much different expression in oligos versus our other cell types. Um, so um, we have a function in Decombo Buddies that performs this step for you um, and kind of calculates the statistics we'll need to um, select those top marker genes. Um, so any questions about the mean ratio process or like the concept here? All right, cool. Make sure I'm not missing anything in the chat. Awesome. Okay. Um, okay, so, so one thing that as I was going through this, um, so like fair warning, once again, like the SE stuff can be like pretty memory intensive. Um, my, my computer could not handle doing the mean marker, the get mean ratio. Um, on the full data set. So just for this demo, I'm going to like subset to just the top half of expressed genes from this data set. Um, so basically just like summing over our genes um, and then like finding the median and then just taking this list of top genes. So this is going to make it half as big. Um, if you were working, so I would advise doing this step on like the cluster if you can, um, because then you can use your full genes, but just like there's limits here. Um, you know, maybe I'll do some computer wizardry and make uh, get mean ratio to more computationally efficient. So we don't like, you know, so it is more like laptop friendly, but um, for right now, this is the step I took to make it work here. Um, so this takes a second. Oh, I didn't load my function. I didn't. Oops, sorry guys. Didn't actually load my package that I've talked so much about. Um, Okay. Um, yeah, so get mean ratio two, we look at the help. Um, so what it takes as an input is, let's see, let's make this bigger. Um, it takes your SCE object, and then you also tell it the cell type column that you like want to look at. Um, so for our case, we have this cell type broad, so that is what we're gonna tell it. So you tell it that as like a string, so it knows what the column to look at. Um, and then you also tell it the assay names. So we recommend using log counts because that's going to be like the normalized uh, like data. So that's like the, what we recommend using, but you could use the counts if you wanted to. And then you can also add the symbol, which is gonna find the symbol out of your gene names and add it to the column. So that kind of makes this more human readable. For this data, um, the row names are actually the symbols. So I'm not going to use the argument. So our row names are already symbols. Um, so we'll run this for a second. Um, yes. So the little warning about like the sparse to dense correction, like um, coercion, uh, is because like single cell experiments are often stored as sparse matrices um, because uh, there's a lot of zeros in the data themselves, so they are like sparse friendly. So that's one way that single cell experiments can be like um, more memory friendly and computational friendly is like keeping them sparse, so basically not storing zero values. Um, uh, but for this purpose, I need it to be a dense matrix, which means we put all the zeros back in and we kind of lose that memory efficiency. So maybe if I get better at the uh, sparse matrix uh, stuff, we can make get mean ratio two even better. Might be a get mean ratio three because we're already on the second iteration of that function. Okay, so now we have our marker sets table and let me explain what's going on here. So we have our genes. So here's our different, you know, our gene names. Also, we're looking at the symbols here. Um, so this column cell type target. So this is like the cell type that we're looking at. So basically um, for every target or for every cell type, it's gonna have statistics about almost every gene. Um, so 
gene, cell type target, and then the mean target. So this is the mean expression of our target cell type. And the next column is cell type. So this is the highest non-target cell type. So for this gene, Astro is the highest non-target cell type. Um, so we can see that the mean is here, it's 0.9, and the mean of our second non-highest target is 0 0.3. Um, so this is quite a big jump, and our ratio ends up being 24. So, and then the rank ratio of this is 1. So this is the best marker gene for oligos out of this current data set. And then it gives you a little annotation. Um, I see we have a question in the chat. Um, ooh. Okay, so a question from KJ. When selecting a single cell reference, would you say it's more important to have a lot of cells and to see rare populations or to have high read depth? Um, so I think like the first part of your question where it's like important to have lots of cells to see rare cell populations, I would say that depends on like your research question. If that's like you are interested in finding those rare cell type populations in your bulk data, you think that's important to like what you're trying to get at. Um, you know, you're trying to like see if there's like more of like maybe like a really rare immune population or something is there. So I would say that that's maybe more related to like your research question. Um, and then high read depth, um, I guess we haven't explored that too much. I guess it would be better to have more information and like have your data be less sparse. Um, but I don't know if it's like a direct trade-off between the two, but those are, that's a really good question. Thanks, KJ. Um, uh, yeah, so this is the, output from get mean ratio. This is going to contain the information that we need to, oh, Katie says thanks. Okay. This is going to contain the information that we need um, to like select our marker genes. So basically we're going to use this rank ratio column to select uh, a list of marker genes. Um, so any questions here? Um, okay. So then we can move on to the more fun part, which is um, plot, plotting like marker expression. Um, this is like, uh, so this is kind of hard to do. So I uh, wrote a little function that does this. So basically it takes your S plot marker express is like a fast way to plot your marker genes. Um, so it takes your SCE object, it takes your marker statistics object, and then you can tell it what cell type you're interested in plotting, and then the cell type column, again, to select for, and then the number of genes you'd like to plot, and then like what column that's pulling that from. And then it adds a little annotation to your column and you tell it what annotation. So by default, this has a little annotation, but if you wanted to expand upon this or edit this or whatever, it would also take a different column as an annotation. Um, Yeah, so basically what it plots is these violin plots um, annotated with the mean expression, these bars that show the mean expression. Um, so basically you can kind of see that like, it's a little, I mean, it's kind of supposed to be a little boring where it's like we only really have expression in our excitatory because that's like the cell types we are looking for. Um, and then it lists our like our mean expression, uh, the, the ratios up here. So we could try for another cell type. Um, let's check out all ago. Yeah, so you can see that we get like nice clean expression for like our different cell types. Um, so this is like a function that kind of works off of your table and works off of, um, oh, okay. So this is like, I guess a bug. It's supposed to list the marker, the gene names up here, um, but maybe something is a little bit awry. I'll look into that. Um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so it's supposed to have your genes listed up here next to the ranks. Um, so I'll work on that. Um, but yeah, you can see that you can see these nice clean ones where we basically only really have expression in our top marker genes. So um, something that's helpful to do is like look at, so top 25 is like a number that we've been using for marker genes. Um, we kind of like came to that by comparing it to like kind of like a, I don't know, other way of, okay, that's not gonna plot nice. Um, uh, log fold, or I guess like um, one versus all like enrichment analysis um, and kind of looking at what we call like hockey stick plots. I'm not going to run that now because the one versus all analysis takes a long time. Um, but basically what we found is like the mean ratios are like almost always a subset of like the top um, different, or I guess like the enrichment genes. Um, maybe I'll show the hockey stick plots. 
Um, yeah, so just for some background about how we came to 25, is that we compared our mean ratio statistics to log full change, which is from the one versus all enrichment um, analysis. So if anybody's interested in that, we can talk more. But basically what we found is that um, our mean ratio genes are kind of like a, like these would, highest mean ratio genes would be these guys like out here. And they're kind of a subset of ones that would have high log full change with the enrichment analysis. Um, so we found that 25 was like, usually the set that was like pretty off of the uh, the zero on the x-axis here. So that's why we chose 25. Um, so we found that to be a good level. Once again, this are, these are um, details that we are exploring in some of our deconvolution benchmark projects, but 25 has been like our working number that we've been working with and I would advise to use for the time being. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do is do a couple of little more data tweaks to prep for actually running BISC. Um, so we're going to add, so because like our, RSC, our single cell experiment object, the row names are the gene symbols, we're going to also assign the gene symbols from our RSC gene as the row names. Cause right now it's the ensemble IDs. Like if we take a look, um, yeah. So right now our row names in our RSC gene are the ensemble IDs, which is pretty common. Um, I guess like ideally you'd probably want to use the ensemble IDs with both. Um, because there's less duplicates and like it's like more more concrete of a annotation, but um, the data we're using has like the symbols as the row names. Also, the symbols are much more like human friendly, so sometimes we'll see that. Um, but basically, the you want them to match. Um, so we're going to assign that over, and then we're going to um, pull out our marker genes. So we're going to take our marker stats. We're going to filter for our rank ratio to be less than or equal to 25. So that way we're taking the top 25 marker genes. And then we're also going to check that our genes are in the row names of our RSC genes, because we want those genes to exist in both data sets. Um, I might have to load. Nope, we're good. Um, so we'll check the length. So we have 123. I think we expected to have 125, but perhaps two of the genes in our uh, um, Maybe some of the genes in our um, RSE or in the single cell object were not in an RSE object, so we avoided those. So you can get fancier and like select more or fewer, and like exam. You should examine those more closely if you're actually going to like do this as part of like a formal analysis. This would be like a fast, quick, and dirty way to get to a list of marker genes. Okay. So now we're going to move on to actually running BISC. I guess. Um, KJ has a question on the chat. Oh. How do you determine off the cutoff for top marker genes? Um, yeah, so if you were going to run this as like, we'll, we'll bring back, I don't know if this question was asked before or after these hockey stick plots. Um, I would say if you were going to run like a formal analysis, I would like recommend running the one versus all like enrichment as well and creating these uh, marker plots like this, these, these hockey stick plots so you can see like um, how clean the markers look. I would also recommend like examining these markers, um, like plotting these like pretty and like plotting them all and examining them and making sure that they all look pretty nice and clean. So those are like the two checks we've done. Um, and yeah, usually about around 25 things start getting a little wonky. Um, you start seeing expression from other cell types in these plots as well. Um, well, does that answer your question, KJ? Oh. Okay, cool. All right, so we'll move on to the main event, which is actually running BISC. Um, so once again, there's many different softwares that run um, deconvolution. BISC is one that we found that's like pretty stable and gives us like what we consider reasonable answers. So it is like our go-to uh, for now. Again, stay tuned for like a further exploration of these different methods. Um, but yeah, we're gonna run BISC right now. So again, you'll have to install it off um, it's available on CRAN. It's not available through Bioconductor. Um, so the first thing we have to do is convert both of our data sets to expression sets, um, which are like summarized experiment, but they're a little bit more basic. So this is kind of like an annoying step. Um, but basically what I did, and, and just here again, just for memory's sake, I'm subsetting to just our list of marker genes in both of our objects. Um, and then it also wants the counts, not the log counts. So that's a, that's a detail. Um, yeah, so we're gonna subset to the counts of, it's gonna take the, 
Basically what I'm doing here is extracting the counts of our RSC gene, which has been subsetted to just our marker genes. And then that's gonna take that as our assay data. And then our phenotype data, it's gonna take, um, it just wants the sample. Um, and then for the expression set SCE, um, a similar thing, we're gonna take our SCE object, subset to our marker genes, extract the count mat matrix, and then um, we're gonna give it our cell type column. So this is again, our important column that BISC is going to use to like, uh, the, you know, that's the cell type. And then it also wants the donor. I don't think there's a function if these have overlapping um, like samples. So if you had like uh, the same uh, like tissue from the same individual, you could match them up. We don't in this case, and we're not gonna use that, um, but this would be a, like the column that would be important for that. Um, and then another important check that's going to happen down here is there's like an error where if any of your, you know, we filtered from a very long list of genes to a very short list of genes. And if any of the nuclei in your single cell data, like if any of those nuclei have zeros across all of our marker genes, that creates an error in BISC. So you have to do a little check to make sure that any of the column sums don't equal zero and then filter out those cells. When I've run this in the past, it's like two or three I've had to like filter out. Here in this data set, it's zero cells, so we don't have to do anything easy. Okay, so then this is where we're going to actually run BISC. It's very quick. Um, so here we're going to use this bulk expression set and the uh, expression set SCE. So the bulk uh, expression set, yeah, so it takes that. And then the reference, which is the single cell expression set, takes our single cell expression set. And then you have to tell it the cell type column. So here's our cell type broad column that we defined, and then the subject names, which is donor, uh, again. Um, and then use overlap false. Um, yeah, so it goes very quick. Um, yeah, so it uh, gives us a little message, decompo decomposing into six cell types using 123 genes. Uh, didn't filter anything out, it looked pretty good. So we get this um, object called S props, estimated proportions. So this actually contains like a bunch of stuff. Um, maybe that was not the best way to show it. Um, so it contains like a couple different objects in this. It's a list of a couple of different objects. Um, the one that we're gonna use is bulk proportions, um, but it also has uh, some other information about like how BISC was run, including the proportion of single cells, our normalization, uh, genes used and the transform bulk data. Um, so again, oh boy. Um, so uh, right now, uh, bulk props is a big is a matrix that is going to be the, um, uh, I guess like your samples by the cell types. Right now, it's cell types or it's samples as the columns. So I don't think that that's like super helpful to look at because like it doesn't work well with like head. Um, so I usually transpose it so that it flips, and then we can check out. What this data looks like. So it's going to give us a matrix where the columns are our cell types. Um, so, you know, these are the cell types that we wanted to decom uh, decompose to. And then our rows are our samples. So for each sample, we have an estimate across all six of our cell types. And this is going to sum to one because um, it's a fraction. Um, so, does anybody have a question there? Yeah, so this is like the output. So if you're going to be like, I want to run deconvolution, you want to know the proportions, this would be this would be the uh, the final output. Um, so one thing that we can I like to do is create something that's called like a composition plot. Um, if I pull up my readme from my package, and we can explore this a little bit. Um, this part I didn't totally prep. Um, yeah, so basically what we want to look at is just like what do those look like in kind of like a a graph format. So I make like this bar plot where it sums to one and then we can see the different proportions. And then maybe if you wanted to look at them over different um, groups, such as case and control, we can do that as well. Um, so I do this by creating what I called like proportion long. So right now this would be in what's like a wide format. Um, and we want to make it like a little bit more um, like tidyverse friendly because we're going to be using ggplot. Um, so we have our estimated bulk proportions, which we flipped up here. Um, we're going to convert it to a data frame. We're going to use our row names to call, and we're going to call that sample. Um, and then we're going to pivot it longer. Oh, this is also tidier.
Okay, that's somewhere in the tidyverse. Is it, <clears throat> is it maybe missing an S? Row names the columns? Um, I think it's just, I think it is just column. I'm pretty sure that that's that. We could use the function it's, apropos. Oh, yeah, table, yeah. It's from table package. Oh, it's from table? Okay, yeah. Yes. Thanks. Um, yeah, so table being in the tidyverse, you know, uh, sometimes when you use tidyverse a lot, you get a little, a little lazy about what function comes from where. But um, yeah, basically we're going to create this proportion long, which is a, a table that is, um, this is now the long version of the data. So we have our sample, cell type becomes a column, and then proportions. So this takes a wide data, makes it long and skinny. Um, so this is more like tidyverse ggplot friendly. Um, so that's why we might do that step. Um, and then if we look at the help for uh, plot composition bar. So this is a, a function I wrote in the decombo buddies package. Um, so it takes prop long. Um, um, and then right now the sample column, it's going to be really we can try it as a, um, and then, so the default is that it's like X column is like all, so it's gonna plot us just like one big block. So this is gonna be like the, um, the like the mean proportions of like what this uh, predicted. So if we go over this, we have 7% uh, yeah, astrocytes, 22 excite inhibitory, Breakdown. So I would say like the biggest proportion it predicted was like oligos from these samples. Um, so I'd say that it's like maybe consistent with what, what we've seen with like DLPFC. Um, but if you wanted to add details, like for instance, like we have like a case control and also like um, sex from this RC gene, what you might want to do is like um, uh, you can take the call data and like convert and then like filter some of that to. Um, like a, a data frame and then bind it onto prop long. Um, so we can do that now. That's data frame, because it's um, it's capital, it's like the S4 vectors, you know, capital D, capital F data frame, which doesn't play nice with tidyverse tools. So you have to convert it to a data frame. Um, so let's select, um, I forget what's going on in RSE gene. So we want sample ID. Or actually, I think rnum is actually what we're using as sample in this data. Yeah, rnum. So then we could also select, um, we could check out um, sex. Uh, let's check out sex and diagnosis. I scrolled way up. Okay. So we're calling this sample. And then we can also we'll left join this on. Yeah, so basically the idea is that you can add like as many like descriptor columns to your proportion long, and it'll be like um, compatible with this prop composition bar. So like categorical values like case control and sex are like maybe what I designed it for, but um, you know, anything that you can make discrete values. Um, you could plot this over. Um, also, if you have like not a ton of samples, it looks nice if you plot them all. 500 might be too many. Maybe we'll subset to top 10 and just take a look. Um, so we're gonna left join this uh, phenotype data object on, onto our proportion long. Um, so we check that out now. So we've added um, sex and diagnosis to this and then um, we can then change, uh, we can add our X column. Let's do diagnosis. Oh, oh underscore. Yeah, so this then splits and then um, finds the mean proportions for your two different cases. So to me, it looks like these are pretty even. Um, you can run like t-test across the like, gear to case controls, for instance, and um, 
like test if that was like significant difference and like box plots can also be good to plot. Um, but I have this tool for plotting these composition bars. Um, we can try sex as well. Um, again, pretty, pretty subtle differences, but um, that's all right. Um, let's do, let's try sample. I think it's gonna look a little crazy, but we can try. Okay, so our text looks pretty bad. Um, we can say add text equals false. Yeah, so again, this is like a lot of samples. So we, we could filter it to look, but you can kind of see that, that there is like some variation across like our different samples. You can kind of see that wobble in this, um, in this plot. Uh, so yeah, that's how you use some of these functions um, and uh, explore some of the output. Um, cool. So that was kind of like everything I wanted to demo today. Um, any Any questions or, comments. That was great. great. Thank you. Thanks. So <clears throat> you went way beyond uh, BISC, right? So a lot of the combo bodies too. So it was yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm trying to make it like a tool that's like helpful. Um, there's more functions for plotting uh, gene expression. Uh, this is a, I guess, like a major headache of mine. Um, so we also have like, uh, so just like some tips and tricks for plotting gene expression. Um, there's like a, I think it's called plot expression from scatter um, and that plots the, okay. So the gripe I have there is that it plots a lot of points in there. So it makes these plots like really big. Often there's like thousands and thousands of nuclei or cells in these data sets. So it basically looks like it's just a solid fill, but when it's a PDF, it becomes like huge and they become slow and hard to load, hard to send, hard to share. Um, so that's why I kind of like the solid fill and that's why I've kind of designed these functions to plot solid fills. Um, let's see, if I remember. Um, I also have a function, let's see, gotta read my own reference over here. Um, plot gene express. So yeah, like I said, these are kind of all um, under development still. So if anybody does use these and find problems like let me know. I'm sure there's bugs in here. Um, so like if we wanted to plot MVP, for instance, maybe that's like a mark. Uh, GFAP is like a marker for astrocytes. Uh, let's, let's try these guys. Um, so yeah, you can do this without the marker stats. You can just plot like the old genes and this is plot gene express, not plot marker express. Oh. It doesn't take the statistics. It just wants the list of genes. Um, yeah, so plot gene express is then part of the uh, internal workings of my plot marker express, but it adapts kind of like the statistics and it adds those as labels. So yeah, so this might be another function that people find helpful because um, it can kind of be a little bit of a bear to get a single cell experiment to be like in a ggplot friendly status. Um, again, that's like with like the wide and long uh, and like the data frame stuff. So this kind of does some of that internal stuff for you. Uh, so this might be a function people are interested in as well. Cool. All right, um, but yeah, I hope people find this helpful.